Okay. Bob, do you have a way of telling whether we've got folks tuned in on the YouTube channel yet? Get an idea if we've got folks lined up or need to wait a little bit. Okay, well, it's 6.02, so I think just so we can keep folks on schedule that have taken time tonight, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, for folks that are listening on our YouTube channel, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, just uh, so folks are aware, you can probably actually see us on your screen, but um, my name's Chris Kern. I'm with uh, ODFW, and I'm the West Region Manager uh, for the agency. We've got a number of other folks from the agency as well. Uh, Sarah Gregory, Umpqua Watershed District Manager, Gary Vondero, the Assistant District Fish Biologist in the in the Coos Coquille Charleston area. Um, Dr. Chris Lorian from our Conservation Recovery Program, Dr. Mark Johnson, a research analyst with ODFW, as well as uh, Scott Patterson and Ryan Couture, uh, who are involved in our propagation programs. Uh, and we are uh, Tonight here, our purpose is just to provide an overview of a proposal we've been working on uh, to implement a conservation hatchery program for the Coquille River Fall Chinook salmon population. And as folks may know, uh, the Coquille Fall Chinook population is in a highly depleted status at the moment, uh, has been for about the last four years. Uh, we'll go over uh, some of the reasons for that status uh, in the presentation and talk about actions uh, to address those problems. Um, also want to point out we've been working extensively with the Coquel Indian tribe on this proposal uh, and it is a cooperative project and while we're hosting this meeting as the state fish and wildlife management agency I want to make sure we take some time to recognize the work the Coquel tribes putting in uh, on the Coquille Fall Chinook population in partnership with us and others including the local community and volunteers and so uh, it's been a a uh, bad situation with the Coquille population, but a great working partnership um, that we're developing between the tribe and ODFW. Uh, just in terms of process, and I'll touch on this a little later as well, but we're set up as ODFW uh, to take this proposal to our commission on August 5th at their, at their upcoming meeting, and I'll talk a little more about that in a bit. Um, if you have questions or comments on the presentation as we go through, um, go ahead and submit those. Uh, to the online form, and when I get the um, slideshow open, you'll see that we've put the uh, the um, address for those comments at the bottom of each of the slides, same address on all slides, and it's also the uh, same address that was in our news release. If you have that handy, it might be simpler. So, uh, so we'll go through the presentation first and then um, provide some opportunity to respond to some questions. I know we already have a couple to, to respond to that came in earlier. Um, so, uh, we'll, with that, we'll move on. And let me remember how to share my screen. Oh, there we go. Can uh, one of the ODFW folks let me know if you can see that? The slideshow? Yes, yes. I can. Great. Okay. So as I mentioned, we're here to present, talk about the Coquille Fall Chinook uh, proposed conservation hatchery program. Uh, you may see the link at the bottom of the page there. That's the one for submitting questions and comments, uh, and that'll be on every slide, so you don't have to scramble to write it down now if you're if you're listening online. Um, so let me. Oop, 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 sorry, I need to make a little adjustment. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, as we started, the coquille population's not doing well. Um, to put it to put it very mildly, um, it's actually very essentially has crashed. Uh, since 2017. Uh, from the period of 1986 through 2017, our average abundance in the spawning population was around 11,000 fish. The lowest we'd seen was 3,500 in 2007, um, which was another period, uh, the last period sort of before the most recent one where we had a fairly significant downturn in ocean conditions, and that did affect a number of coastal populations uh, during that same time frame. But you'll see that after 2007, 
you know, as early as 2010, just three years later, we actually reached our modern high of 32,000 fish in the population just, just a few years later. So the population was still able to bounce back from those poor ocean conditions. However, the most recent few years, our highest number is 900 fish uh, in 2020. That's only 25% of our prior low. So over the last four years, the best we've had was a quarter of the worst we'd had in the prior 30, just as sort of a rough context for folks. Pretty bad. Uh, so Coquille doing very badly. Um, but how does it compare to other other basins? Um, and so we've got a timeline here for just a couple of nearby rivers, the Umpqua and the Coos. Uh, and we do generally see the population cycle together up and down to some degree. Um, but, you know, you kind of look at the lows in the Umpqua and the Coos, and they're not all that different from some prior lows, whereas the Coos or the Coquille was markedly lower than prior lows. Um, and so we did see decline, just not as dramatic in those other basins. And then um, uh, the uh, other populations also have kind of started to bounce back a little bit, whereas the Coquille just hasn't. Uh, we also looked at uh, whether we were seeing that same kind of decline in other species in the Coquille, and we don't really see it. Steelhead and Coho uh, generally been better off. Uh, even in the Coquille, and in fact, the coho population's actually been doing pretty well in the Coquille over the recent uh, recent past. So we have a general downturn in all the fall Chinook populations for the, you know over the last few years, but dramatically worse for the Coquille. And so trying to dig in and find out why that is uh, was a high priority. So in 2020, our staff uh, conducted a an assessment just trying to identify. Uh, the possible limiting factors for this population. And they identified several to look at uh, and evaluate. Uh, obviously, one is ocean conditions, as I mentioned already, and that's always a factor. In general, our cycles in salmon populations on the coast are, uh, a lot of that is driven by ocean conditions over time. And these are, uh, you know, these populations did encounter pretty poor ocean conditions when they arrived uh, in the ocean, kind of during the period we call the blob. 2015 and even through 2018 or so. Uh, and of course, we also, folks probably remember the 2015 drought was pretty severe, really high temperatures. So pretty bad combination of factors there, but those would apply to pretty much all the rivers uh, on the coast to some degree. Uh, we also have predation in the system and we know that. Um, we've had striped bass in the system for decades uh, and they're a known predator, but you know, prior to this more recent time frame, we hadn't observed this kind of crash, uh, even in the presence of striped bass. But on the other hand, we've got smallmouth bass in the system now, and those are more recent arrivals. Uh, they were illegally introduced into the basin in the mid 2000s, probably. And in the last several years, we've really seen an expansion of the smallmouth population, both in number and area. Uh, and a lot of the uh, expansion in area in terms of where they can occupy is tied to water temperatures. So they improved increased water temperatures, not improved, um, can uh, open up uh, essentially more areas uh, for them to move into and, and uh, tolerate those temperatures. So they've been able to expand through the basin. Um, we also looked at environmental factors in the river like temperatures and river flows. Um, we do have temperatures in the main stem and major forks that, that become pretty inhospitable for salmonids during the summer time frame. Um, there are some landscape level issues where, you know, we essentially are going to require landscape level restoration to try and uh, improve habitat and mitigate some of those effects. We do see, as I kind of mentioned earlier, strong evidence that when the warm water temperatures occur, it does allow the bass to expand further upriver and that allows them to start overlapping more with where juvenile Chinook are going to be present and migrating through. And then you add on the fact that as the water warms, those smallmouth bass become much more active and feed much more actively. Uh, so sort of a double whammy. And then the Chinook coming out of the Coquille are primarily migrate out as what we call an age zero smolt. Uh, and so they leave the upper uh, areas where they're being, where they're rearing kind of at that same time as temperatures rise. And so unfortunately that, that puts them in direct path basically with predators, uh, with the warming, uh, uh, warming, seasonal warming that brings those predatory fish online as sort of active feeders. 
uh, right sort of during the out migration period, or at least uh, very close to it. Uh, so overlaps and causes some issues, uh, obviously there. Uh, unlike a lot of our other coastal systems, the Coquille doesn't really have a lot in the way of cold water inputs. And so it's not snow driven like some other rivers, doesn't have really significant groundwater inflow. So essentially subject to direct warming just in in correlation to what the air temperatures are. Uh, so things like shading uh, could really be beneficial to help keep those uh, riparian areas uh, in the shading um, to keep those temperatures down. And uh, there was a, you know, like many rivers on the coast, there's been a lot of historic habitat restorations trying to reverse some of the long-term impacts like splash damming and gravel and timber operations uh, and a number of other things. Uh, we do also have uh, evaluated uh, the potential for hatchery interactions to be a limiting factor. And there's a very small, not very small, but a fairly small harvest augmentation program uh, at the Bannon hatchery on the Coquille, that hatchery is low in the system and the fish are generally also released low in the system. Uh, historically, it's used a pretty high rate of wild fish in the brood stock, which is generally uh, uh, a little better on the genetics in terms of future integration risks. We don't tend to see much overlap with wild juveniles and the hatchery juveniles. Uh, so not expecting any significant competition effects amongst the juveniles, and we don't see a lot of hatchery fish on spawning grounds. So not a lot of evidence there for uh, intergression and and similar issues. Uh, also, that hatchery has been in operation for a long time, uh, and we hadn't observed this kind of issue in the past, and the hatchery returns have also been very poor recently. So uh, long way of saying we don't think the hatchery program is a limiting factor either. Uh, disease is another potential. We don't have a lot of information on disease sampling in the basin, but what, what we do have doesn't lead us to um, any serious concerns at the moment. And so just the long and short of it is our, our long-term main focus issues uh, to try and take action on this issue are really are, uh, obviously ocean conditions are always going to be an issue and we want to work to understand those better. Um, but in terms of things we can turn the dial on in the short-term predation, uh, and uh, working with environmental factors, specifically with ha uh, specifically through habitat restoration work, are some big ones. Uh, the 2020 assessment also had some recommendations for actions, kind of following from our identification of those limiting factors. Uh, obviously, a predation I mentioned is uh, a big one, and so our near-term action here is to work on direct removals of, of smallmouth bass and striped bass. Uh, we've done a lot of that by encouraging the public to help us out through harvest. Um, we've liberalized regulations and done some other things that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, those are our main tools at the moment. There are some potential future uh, technologies that might come online at some point to, uh, to help us out. There's some work on other species to create what's called a YY male, which is a, a male fish with two Y chromosomes. And if you introduce those fish into a population, you you can create a, a sterile matings uh, from that fish down the road, and you can potentially reduce their reproductive success. Uh, there's a lot of work going on with brook trout and other species. Uh, we're not there yet on smallmouth bass, but I know it's on a lot of folks' radar, uh, and it'll obviously be on ours. Uh, we definitely want to improve, as I kind of mentioned earlier, improve our understanding of the effects of freshwater and ocean conditions on both the Chinook population and our predator populations. And that's just more research down the road and, and working with others to gather more information. Being conservative on, on our fishery management, which we have done, and I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, and then also indicated in 2020, it was a recommendation to, you know, start considering the use of a conservation hatchery program as an emergency measure for this population. And that's uh, what we're here about to talk to talk about today, primarily. So I mentioned uh, a minute ago that you know we've we actually started a bunch of actions already. Uh, we we actually started sort of addressing, trying to address smallmouth issues right away in 2011 when we really uh, confirmed that they were present. Uh, we removed the bag and size limits in the Coquille Basin and also some other nearby basins. Um, and staff actually were actively out trying to find spawning areas and, and destroying nests when they could, trying to get on top of the issue. But, you know, within a pretty short time, we realized the train had kind of already left 
the station horse was out of the barn and uh, we really couldn't uh, uh, prevent their expansion at that point. Um, so we've also, as I mentioned, we've tried to take other measures to liberalize harvest on bass. Uh, so the public can help us. So we allow spear fishing for these fish in most years now. Uh, used to be that you couldn't use bait uh, in these fisheries, and and we've changed that as well. So trying to encourage um, the public to to remove fish. Um, so we don't have a lot a lot of time to go into too much detail, but you know the agency and the Coquel tribe have been working hard on this action, and I know we've also had a lot of volunteer help. Uh, good example is within, I think, last weekend, I think it was, Port of Coquille conducted uh, their derby, um, which was an effort to aid in smallmouth removals. And so very much a cooperative effort amongst a lot of folks. We also went out uh, last year, again, with the help of others and collected uh, a lot of biological information on bass to try and start understanding their population dynamics in the basin. So that'll help us craft our, our future actions more, more efficiently. A lot of folks are probably aware we've taken some significant actions on the harvest fisheries as well. So the year after we observed the initial decline, we dropped the bag limit uh, substantially in the fall fishery. Uh, in 2020, we allowed some fishing for hatchery only fish and only in a portion of the lower bay. And then for 2020 and this year, we've actually just closed angling for salmon outright in the Coquille Basin. Um, I mentioned earlier, coho are actually doing pretty well. So, you know, closing angling to all salmon does currently eliminate a possible opportunity for coho fishery. But given with where we're at, we just uh, didn't think that was appropriate um, given the poor status of this coquille falchion population. Uh, and then the, uh, another one is, you know, we normally, I mentioned earlier, would have put a pretty high proportion of wild fish into the brood stock at Bannon Hatchery, but per our coastal management plan, uh, once we've hit these kind of low levels um, in the population, wild population, we stopped doing that. So we haven't been doing that for the last few years. And then the last one is we've been working on this coquille um, uh, proposal for a coquille uh, conservation hatchery. And the operational plan is sort of the main document we've got for that. And it's posted on our website, uh, was also linked in our news release. So uh, we're not going to go into great detail on it tonight, but that is a uh, a good resource for folks to read if you haven't uh, had time to do that yet. So a uh, brief note, just in sort of by way of explaining what we mean by conservation hatchery program and, and how it differs from kind of what our normal hatchery programs might be, air quoting normal. Um, we basically have two types of programs uh, that we operate. Uh, one would be sort of phrased as the harvest augmentation program and its purpose is primarily to enhance or maintain fisheries, although we definitely do uh, craft those programs so that we don't impair the coexisting naturally reproducing population. And we do have an augmentation program at Bannon Hatchery. That's the one I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we have the, uh, the uh, and we, you know, so we have a harvest augmentation program at Bannon. We have planned to continue that uh, as of now. Um, and then there's a conservation hatchery program is the other type. Uh, and its purpose is really not to supply fish for a fishery, but to instead to maintain or increase the number of naturally produced fish while still not reducing the productivity of the naturally produced fish population uh, in the process. And there's several different ways or several different forms of conservation hatchery program. Uh, things like egg banking or captive rearing programs have been done in other places. Uh, what we're proposing for the coquille would actually be labeled as a supplementation conservation hatchery program. And that is just to get a little more specific is a program whose purpose is to route a portion of that population, the wild population through a hatchery for part of its life cycle to get a, a survival boost. And so in particular, in this instance, trying to get the uh, portion of the fish out of the path of predators in particular uh, is is one of the main ones that we're looking at for this plan. So an overview real quick of, you know, some of the objectives we established with the tribe. Um, you know, when we, op when we implement a conservation hatchery um, program, our policy uh, requires that we go and establish objectives uh, to guide that uh, program ahead of time. And so we've done that in coordination with the tribe. And essentially our three objectives here, uh, one is just simply prevent extirpation of these naturally produced fall Chinook. 
uh, try and avoid extinction while we uh, work on the primary limiting factors, uh, which will take time. And so this is an interim emergency measure. Uh, secondly, while we're doing that, we want to be able to conserve the genetic diversity of naturally spawning fall shook in the Coquille Basin. And then in terms of uh, where we want to see this population go, we want to increase the abundance of naturally produced fall Chinook to what we think could be a self-sustaining level. Uh, and then that we're, we're defining that right now as uh, returns of unmarked fall Chinook that exceed our coastal multi-species plan critical abundance threshold, which is what that acronym stands for, of uh, 2,800 and change uh, spawning fish for four consecutive years. We also want to make sure we can assess a high likelihood of regularly being over that mark in the future. And we'll come back to this a little bit in, in a couple of slides, but that's the basic uh, overview. In terms of how we want to get there and what our plans are for the programs, a little more specifically, we're looking at a maximum program size of about 100,000 smolts. Um, we don't really think we can get there right out of the gate. We've got some uh, a couple of issues, some with capacity in our hatchery system uh, that we need to deal with. Uh, and frankly, also working out ways to collect the broodstock. So uh, we have our staff, Gary and others, uh, as well as the tribe, uh, tribal uh, staff, have some experience in collecting fish out in the river when there's a lot of them. Um, but when we've got a low return, like we're seeing now, they, they frankly, a little harder to find. And so we're going to be working on methods to collect those fish. Uh, and, you know, we're not sure if we can collect, uh, how many we can collect this year coming out of the gate. So um, for 2022, that's this fall, uh, we think we can probably rear about 47,000 smolts given existing capacity. And if we do that, we're looking for about 15 pairs of fish uh, from the wild population. Again, over over time, our goal is to uh, find more space uh, and make sure we can refine our collection methods so that we would, you know, more likely be able to consistently achieve around seventy five to one hundred thousand uh, fish on an annual basis. Is kind of where we want to end up. So that's our that's our goal. It'll take some time to get there, um, but that's what we're committed to working on. And then smolts, just as an example of sort of our rearing, you know, the smolts we collect that. That the eggs we collect uh, in 2022, we'd raise the smolts and uh, target releasing those in late winter of 23 or early um, early spring of 2024. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we're gonna hundred. We're gonna mark all the fish um, either with a coat of wire tag or with what's called parental based tagging, which is a genetic method um, to identify fish uh, when they come back as adults. Um, and that, um, so our goal here is to make sure that those fish in the conservation hatchery program do make it to the spawning grounds. And so we don't intend those fish to be harvestable, uh, in fisheries. And so we're not planning on putting thin clips on them. Uh, the, uh, the augmentation program out abandoned does get fin clipped. And so we would preserve some opportunity uh, in the future to have some hatchery only fisheries, potentially in the lower bay, if things improve a little bit, particularly if we're uh, doing okay on getting towards brood stock and the, we see a little bit of rebound in the wild population. Uh, so we want to preserve that possibility um, down in, into the future. But again, we're, we're going to do everything we can to pass as many of these fish through uh, the river to the spawning grounds uh, to contribute to those natural abundances. Um, Spawning protocols, I mentioned earlier, we want to, you know, save the genetic diversity of this population. So we'll be looking to use spawning protocols that, that help us maximize that within the, you know, sort of feasibility of how many fish we gather and such. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, the other, um, we're going to uh, intend to acclimate these smolts in the upper areas of the basin. And that is really we want these fish to return to the areas where natural fish are already spawning. And that means upper basin. Uh, so we want to imprint those fish to that area so they'll return there. Uh, but we recognize that in doing that, we're actually putting them right back into the path of smallmouth bass, potentially. And so we're looking to, uh, to use timing of release and size of fish at release as ways to try and get around that. And so specifically, I mentioned late winter, early spring, colder part of the year, uh, potentially higher flows, uh, as long as we time it right. 
So combination of trying to release them when conditions are cooler and the bass are less active and also have some high flows to get them out of the river a little more quickly. Um, but we're going to be monitoring this population and adapting these uh, methods as we go. Uh, just a kind of a really hypothetical, and so this is completely hypothetical. Uh, it's just an example of sort of what we mean uh, or intend to try and achieve through this conservation hatchery program. Uh, and so very simply, as I said, we're just trying to add uh, spawner abundance to the spawning grounds with natural spawners. Um, and so we're, we're um, providing spawners, not fish for harvest. Uh, and so the idea that they would contribute to spawning uh, in the basin and help boost this population again while we're working on the other measures. So this is an emergency uh, uh, approach. And then once we've achieved those objectives, so once we've addressed limiting factors and gotten the population back on its feet, so to speak, then the program would terminate and fade out over time as essentially we'd stop, uh, stop the program itself, but we'll have a few more years of fish returning. So you can kind of see, you know, if we start the program here on the left side where that little blue section starts to uh, starts to occur. Those are returning fish from the spawners. Looks like an arrow that I had drawn on here, didn't show. Um, and then over time, those fish contribute to the spawning. Uh, and of course, across the top, I've just generically labeled address limiting factors. We're starting that now and we'll continue it. So we definitely know we need to improve the situation for Chinook in the basin. Uh, in addition to this action, not uh, this is not to avoid doing those things. It's an emergency measure while we do the other the other work. Um, we also don't know how quickly the population will respond to these things, both from the conservation hatchery program side itself and from the limiting factors side. So that's going to be a monitoring and evaluation effort on our part to see how things go. Uh, we do expect this will take time. We haven't labeled any years or anything on this graph because I want to keep people focused on the fact that it's all hypothetical and an example. But, you know, we think this is probably going to take a few generations of Chinook. And, you know, if we count a four-year generation or maybe even five uh, as Chinook, we're talking 12 to 15 years to really start seeing uh, some response here probably. So it's not going to be tomorrow. And we are coming close to the end here. Um, we uh, also want to put a high priority on monitoring and evaluation and adaptive management. Uh, we are actively working with the tribe uh, to start developing a, a monitoring and evaluation plan for the program. A couple things we know we need to do. We need to ensure we've got sufficient coverage in our existing spawning ground survey methods to give us a good estimate of escapement. We're going to have to increase our coverage uh, in the basin during spawning ground surveys to actually recover the marks from those fish that we put out, whether they're coat of wire tags or parental based tagging. Uh, and so that's going to take some additional effort. Uh, and then, you know, this is going to form the foundation of our ability to adaptively manage uh, all of our uh, management actions in the basin as well, you know, including the hatchery programs. Uh, we also uh, recognize that we need to establish some assessment to review timelines for this program. Uh, and uh, so we're going to uh, meet with the tribe and, and we'll review the status of this population every spring, which we kind of currently do, but we'll, we'll beef that up a bit. Uh, we're going to review the conservation hatchery program periodically, sort of as we get significant pieces of information, that'll be a time to, to do some review. And then we do, uh, we will be tying the comprehensive review at least with the CMP, uh, Coastal Management Plan, a multi-species plan, uh, scheduled comprehensive review. So they're already on a scheduled cycle for uh, sort of mandatory review to ensure that we're, we're um, doing those reviews. And we'll, we'll tie this to that because it essentially will become an action under the multi-species plan here. Those reviews are really gonna be targeted at, you know, do we need to continue uh, the conservation hatchery program? Are we doing a good job on addressing the limiting factors? Uh, I mentioned earlier our objective for abundance of fish. So we, we're we saying now that our, our at the outset that our termination sort of criteria are if we reach our success uh, category, which is that natural spawning abundance over the 2,800 fish mark for four consecutive years, and a high likelihood the population will stay above the threshold. But the reality also is we may at some point determine that there's not a way 
to address the primary limiting factors or mitigate for them. And at that point, we we may pull the plug on the program at, uh, at that point as well. Sincerely hope that's not where we end up. So uh, almost the end, sort of what do we do next? Well, our next steps, uh, we've got our public webinar tonight with an opportunity for questions and comments and just uh, generally hear what we've got planned here. Uh, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission will meet on August 5, uh, and as part of their agenda, this will be on there. Uh, the materials for that meeting should be posted tomorrow, uh, probably close of business. Um, you've always got the opportunity, whether it be for a commission meeting or just generally, to send emails to the commission at the address you see on, uh, on the screen. You can find that on our website, too. And so we'll present this proposal to the commission on the 5th. That meeting will be sort of a hybrid. We've got uh, the ability for folks to come in person, but it'll also be broadcast, I think, basically on the same sort of platform we're using here. Um, and there is a way to sign up for public testimony, both if you want to be there in person or if you want to do it virtually. you got both options, and you can also always send in written comment. Uh, you can find out how to do that at this other link uh, that's on the screen. And again, you can also find that on our website. So with that, I just want to uh, leave with a, a picture here. This is from some work that was done earlier this year, not really directly associated with what we're proposing today, but a lot of folks from the Coquel tribe, ODFW, and a lot of volunteers in the background uh, who have done uh, the background of the picture, not the background of the program. They're front and center of the, of the work. Um, just wanted to put this picture up because it's it's there's been a lot of community energy going into trying to save this population, and I know that's going to continue. We really uh, value that input and uh, that effort that's happening, and so we just wanted to recognize that. Uh, so we've got a number of folks from the tribe and from the local community and from from our staff as well in this picture. I think this was about a month ago. So um, with that, I think that's the end of. Well, I think I know that's the end of our presentation. And so I think what I will do is end the slideshow. If I can do that. And we'll see what we've got for questions. Bob or somebody from ODFW, has it gone back to our regular meeting screen now? Okay, so we're good. Okay, so let me check here and see if we've had any new questions or comments come in. And I'm really only seeing the one we got earlier, so maybe I'll just uh, just go there. Uh, we did get a question submitted earlier today, had a number of parts to it, so I'll just read those parts. Uh, out and kind of have some response and maybe ask if anybody on the team wants to make any comments as well. Um, so multiple parts to this question. It was, uh, can ODFW declare an emergency for Coquille Wild Chinook and make some space at the Coal River Hatchery? That's our hatchery uh, outside a, a trail on the Rogue. Um, is there a plan to protect this fishery in the marine zone during rebuilding years? Have bass traps been deployed like they're used in John Day River? Do we have laws on the books that live wells must be drained before a boat can be transported on land? And can we increase fines for transporting live fish? So a number of questions in there. They're good ones. Um, just starting with the top one. I don't I don't really know that we'd necessarily need to do anything like an emergency declaration to specifically allow us to free up space at Coal Rivers. What we're dealing with really there uh, is we've got some bigger issues at Coal Rivers with the water supply and also some exist some current electrical issues um, that we're really working hard with the Corps of Engineers to try and address. They supply the funding uh, for that site, and so we're kind of subject to their timelines and funding requirements and working real hard at that. And in addition to the issues with the hatchery itself there, we're also kind of short in the southwest area and just, heard of over just sort of overall hatchery capacity in part due to Coal River's issues, but also the lingering effects of the fire at Rock Creek Hatchery on the Umpqua. And so, um, you know, we've got some real pro real challenges there that's going to take some time to sort through. It's kind of why we're starting at where we're starting. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we, we also are kind of just starting this sort of program for the Coquille. And so we're going to take some, it's going to take us a little trial and error to get good at collecting brood. And so 
you know, while we, uh, while we in future years, as we get a little, you know, get more experience with doing that, maybe we will run into real constraints with space. Um, but right now we're, we're sort of, uh, uh, committed to working with the tribe on trying to find some more space and getting, getting the program up, as I said, to that, you know, 75 to a hundred thousand range, um, on a consistent basis. Um, and then, yeah, so, um, that's that one in terms of the marine zone sort of protecting fish out in the ocean you know the the place where we could have some influence on regulations would be in the pacific fishery management council fishing areas uh that's uh, largely going to be oregon and washington but the fisheries in those areas frankly don't catch oregon coastal chinook at very high rates to start with which surprises people a lot sometimes uh, a lot of our fisheries for chinook are driven by uh California stocks off the coast of Oregon. Uh, just an example, I looked it up here a little bit ago. From 2009 through 18, average exploitation rate on our coastal fish in those PFMC fisheries was about 6%. So even if they were limited entirely, it'd be about a 6% savings uh, at the most. Uh, in the past, we have discussed whether we should put a bubble closure at the mouth of the coquille, uh, sort of in the late fall as those fish are coming into the river. So far, we've we've kind of come to the conclusion it probably doesn't provide much benefit, but it's something we could always consider if we if we decide it maybe it will or that it should. Um, on the bass traps, I'm uh, not really uh, sure what those are referring to on the John Day. I'm not sure we have any of that kind of operations, but you know we can certainly look into any of those kind of options. Um, we're always I, mean, I think we're going to be open, it's safe to say we're going to be open to any and all options uh, for ways to catch those fish efficiently. And and also in a way that doesn't put other fish in the basin like ESA listed coho at any additional risk too. That's going to be a, and of course the fall Chinook. Um, so not yet, but we can certainly look at that. And uh, like I say, I think anything's on the table. Um, the, the draining of live wells. Um, you know, as a boat owner, I, I'm aware that, you know, starting last, well, 2020, I think it was, we do now have state law in Oregon that requires those live wells and bilges get drained out of boats before transport. So you're supposed to pull your plugs and drain them before you hit the road. Uh, so that's already in place. And then uh, I, the idea for, you know, increasing fines or penalties or something for illegal fish transport, that's an idea we've heard. Uh, something we can look into. I'm sh I, I'm guessing that's going to require some statutory work by the legislature. Uh, so I don't have an answer for it. Uh, it's it's uh, something that we definitely could look at. So let's see here. Do we have? We got a couple. Okay, we got a couple others. Hang on a second here. Okay, I got a couple questions. Sorry, I'm doing multiple things at once here. Uh, got a couple came in here. Uh, what is the budget for the proposed program and how much will the op overall operational cost be of the program? Um, you yeah, know, that's a good question. I don't know if Ryan or Scott want to jump in on this. For the production part of this, we're we're frankly not talking about a lot of fish, um, and so there are definitely costs for it. But I don't know if we've pinned down exactly what those are uh, at this point. Do you have any comment on that one, you guys? Yeah, I can throw out some numbers, but I th I think we're looking at uh, twenty five to thirty thousand dollars for the biennium, so two uh, yeah. two brood years. Yeah, two groups of okay, fish. Thanks. That'd be fish feed, really, and uh, and the marking that would go with it. Yeah, which is minimal. Yeah. And so the marking piece is a wild card, as it could go way up or it could go down, way down. Yeah, where we do think, I think it's fair to say we think you know we're going to see some increased cost is on the monitoring side, and we are still going to be working through that with folks, uh, particularly with the Coquille Tribe. There, um, you know, I can't speak for them from a you know sort of committing them to anything, but I know from our discussions they are. They are very interested in and very dedicated to uh, building up their ability to do uh, work in the basin like this and, and particularly spawning ground surveys is one we've talked about. And so um, we are 
We haven't fully identified all the resource needs, but we are aware that the Coquel tribe is standing by to provide quite a bit of it. So uh, I will say we've also got a um, kind of related, not necessarily the conservation hatchery program specifically, um, but um, you know, sort of just Coquille in general, we do have a policy option package in place uh, for requested funding for the next biennium. Uh, 2325 to that would allow us to increase um, funding for our efforts on uh, invasive uh, fish species, uh, particularly in the coquille, but would also allow us to address some other areas in the state. So some resources brought to bear there, but not directly in the, the conservation hatchery program itself. So bigger costs will be on the monitoring side, and we're working on that. Again, we've got some time here. Um, fish won't start coming back for a few more years, even when we collect fish this fall, uh, to work those out. So uh, that's about the best I can do on that one at the moment. And then um, let's see what else we got. Uh, stand by for a moment, folks. Just takes me a minute to find stuff. Let's see what else we got. Sorry, folks, I'm still looking here, <laughs> trying to find my way through the technology. And by. All right. Well, let's see here. Oh, sorry. My apologies. I'm not a tech savvy kind of guy. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, this might be for Chris. Probably better. Um, will there be yearly monitoring reports shared in the spring each year with the general public, specifically? how many of the conservation hatchery program fish were recovered each year post spawn chris you want to comment a little bit on sort of your rcmp expert here i think um and we're we're de definitely talking about tying our monitoring and reporting to that to that process do you want to comment on that one yeah thanks chris uh, this is chris lorian uh, with the conservation recovery program uh, we um have uh, a, a annual monitor or an annual annual uh, implementation report that we create for the coastal multi-species plan that consists of several pieces that's about a, a kind of um, narrative report about what we've implemented and then we have wild fish monitoring summaries and hatchery program summaries that are updated annually and this will become a part of those hatchery program summaries this will become a new hatchery uh, program that we report on annually so we'll have information about how many fish went into the brood stock, how many fish we produced for the conservation hatchery program, and um, how many adults we uh, got back from those releases. So that will be incorporated into that annual reporting that we do for the CMB. And I made a reference to uh, ODFW and the tribe uh, sort of reviewing status in the spring. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know that our reporting uh, on that will be a spring time frame uh, for the person that asked the question, but the reporting will will be an annual task. I, I don't know the timing of the year. So Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. That those reports are typically completed in the fall, um, kind of after we complete a cycle of getting, um, you just have to pick some time of year because of the different run types that we report exactly. on. But those, we typically report those in the fall, so um, uh, the public will have access to those each year in the fall when we update those uh, reports. Great, thanks. Okay, so let's look here and see if we've got any more. 
not seeing any at the moment, but we can, uh, we've done this a couple of times and I like to give a little bit of time just to make sure we're, we're done with the questions before we just go to shutting down the meeting. So we'll give it, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Just kind of keep checking the, 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 the system here and see if any new comes in. Um, but haven't had any for mm, five, six minutes now. So we may be close to wrapping up. The folks online, thank you for your patience. Just kind of stand by for a bit while we see if we're done or not. Chris, you know, and this is Mark Johnson. Um, yeah. It might be worth noting that the uh, the parental base tagging or, or code of wire tags, uh, either of those will allow us moving forward uh, to be able to discriminate the production from the conservation hatchery from naturally produced fish in the system. So yeah. that that really is the, the value of either of those tagging approaches. Um, because these fish won't be marked, they won't be readily um, identifiable as hatchery produced fish, but we'll be able to identify them using those those tagging approaches. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That's a good that's a good point. And just from a sort of mechanical standpoint, you know, I mentioned that probably it's going to require some more effort on the spawning grounds. One of the reasons for that is, you know, as as a result of having the coat of wire tag or PBT. You know, we have to get our hands on those fish. And so for coat of wire tags, that means all the carcasses will now have to be wanted with a coat of wire tag detector to identify them as a as a conservation hatchery program fish, um, as opposed to just kind of looking for adipose clipped fish on the grounds. And for PBT, they'd have to actually take a tissue sample. So uh, in either case, you know, more effort involved. Um, and so we'll have to deal with that. And I may not have mentioned during the presentation that you know, we're talking about a wild brood uh, only uh, approach here for the conservation hatchery program. We're not, you know, we're not going to be um, using hatchery um, reared fish uh, or from the other harvest augmentation program. And, you know, we're not looking to use sort of second generation uh, production either, uh, looking to maintain a wild, wild brood approach. So, uh we did just get another question. Gary, I think this one's for you. It says, what's the status of Coquille Spring Chinook? Can you take a shot at that one? Yeah, I can. Um, we did some monitoring um, kind of in the mid 2000s up to about 2010, and we just haven't seen much of those fish anymore. They kind of just uh, uh, vanished out of the system. There may be a couple fish occasionally, but um, we tried to hit all the spawning areas we could possibly find in for four years and never did find a spawning spring Chinook. So. Okay. It's a new one for me, actually. I'll admit that. Uh, it's another question. It says explain how fish boxes work. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that this person's asking about, what's normally called hatchbox um and i can take a crack at it um hatchbox is refer to a sort of a streamside incubator approach which is eggs put into a a system on the on the riverbank where you know they're sort of allowed to hatch out of that box and enter the river uh right there as opposed to going through a more normal hatchery sort of approach and released at a larger size so essentially putting unfed fry into the system. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, something we've done in the past in other areas and in the coquille and um, might be something where if you had, you know, limitations on spawning gravel uh, in the system, you know, that kind of approach might be, if that's your bottleneck, um, might be an approach you'd look at. What we're looking at here is a bottleneck that's predation. And so, um, you know, frankly, hatch boxes are probably going to make more food um, particularly they're going to, they're going to migrate out. You know, one of the things we're going to try and do with the conservation hatchery program is adjust the timing and, and release of the program fish to try and help avoid the predation a little bit. 
um, that wouldn't be possible through a Hatchbox program. Um, I don't know if anybody else. I'm I'm not super experienced with Hatchbox uh, stuff beyond what I already said, which may not have even been correct. But if it was to add to that or correct me on something, feel free. Bruce, this is Scott uh, here in Salem, Fish Propagation Manager. There's not a lot to add. It, it's really a, a fairly simple approach. Just a mesh container that holds eggs because they're round. When the fish hatch, they turn linear and they can swim between the mesh and out they go. Uh, Mortality is pretty high compared to a hatchery. But the intent is you can get those fish into the system early uh, in places that are that's hard to stock. Uh, the imprint to where they come from and the idea was they would be more wildlife hmm. but the results on survival is not very good compared to a full-term small program so okay. when you're Thanks. short and you're looking into a conservation mode where your goal is to improve survival it's probably yeah. not a good choice yeah and in this case part of our problem is we have very low abundances of adult spawners to start with and so not a lot of eggs to spare so to speak so we want to be efficient with that use yeah and that's kind of the premise of a conservation program where your real goal is to improve the survival of that precious genetic population yeah and so you want to maximize their returns with uh, your best hatchery program that you can deploy yeah. and releasing eggs and fries probably not one of them Okay. Uh, let's see. That was about four minutes ago, five minutes ago. We'll give it a give it another couple minutes. See if there's another batch of questions. Just in case. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. Bob, am I missing any, or am I correct that we kind of got the questions that we've got and no new ones? I see seven. We've we've tackled them all. Or actually, five. Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> Okay, well, given that, I think we sort of completed our meeting and answered a few questions. And, you know, like I said earlier, folks uh, online, you know, you've got another opportunity coming with the commission meeting on August 5th. Uh, gives you more time to think on stuff, read the report, ask questions, think about stuff. You come back and ask some more questions then if you want, or if you got some comments to provide, that's that's the next opportunity. Um, and so uh, with that, I think I'll just do one more check. And yeah, so we looks like we are out of questions and uh, certainly I don't have any more to say. You've listened to me long enough. So um, really appreciate folks that were able to take the time tonight uh, and appreciate your interest and uh, definitely encourage you to stay tuned on this one. It's an important issue. Uh, we've got an imperiled population here and need to find a way out of that hole. Um, so with that, I think I'll go ahead and close the meeting out. Thanks to everybody attending. Certainly thanks to the staff for taking your time tonight to be here and Bob for setting everything up. Uh, Bob, you want to go ahead and shut us down and thanks everyone. Have a good weekend.